my three hats I get to wear in my job, one is in the echo lab, which is a great hat to wear. The other is the clinical cardiology, heart failure world. And the third clinic I work in is the amyloid world. And as Dr. O stated, the last few years has just been an explosion in the amyloid literature and our excitement and treatment for it. Um, again, with this presentation, I have no uh, relationships with industry and uh, no off-label use of medications or testing will be uh, discussed. So uh, like Dr. O has noted and what uh, Dr. Villaraga alluded to, I, I noted in the pre-COVID world, there was a dramatic increase in the interest in publication in amyloid patients. You know, really like a thousand fold increase in, in publications uh, over the previous uh, 15 years. And that was blunted a little bit last year, but I think we'll see COVID uh, get settled down, I hope, and more uh, normal publications in the next few years. So what is amyloid uh, and what are the different types and different features that one needs to think about? And from the cardiologist, I think there's, although there's 20 different types of amyloid at least, there's three main types that we really typically think about. And the traditional type of amyloid that you and I and all of us talked about when we were uh, in our training was really AL amyloid. And that is uh, a multi-organ disease and heart failure is common in these patients. And it's the conventional patient that most of us think about when we're thinking amyloid. They have peripheral and autonomic neuropathies, nephrotic syndrome, carpal tunnel, and they can have the macroglossia and the periorbital purpura. So that was the kind of traditional patient that we thought about and learned about when we were in med school. Another type that you could see as a cardiologist is ATTR amyloid. Know a little bit about the naming of the amyloid. Uh, so A is for amyloid, L is for light chain, so that's AL amyloid. So A, T, 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 R, M is a mutated, so that is a TTR or a TTR amyloid that is mutated, and it's usually a veiling uh, mutation, uh, typically. And these are more familial, and only about a 50% of them will have a family history. And it's very heterogeneous in this presentation, but they typically are in their 50s when I see them as a cardiologist. The one type of amyloid that has really caused the explosion in our uh, literature is A amyloid, again, TTR, and then WT wild type, or used to be called senile amyloid. And these uh, patients are much more common now uh, in my amyloid clinic. I used to see mostly AL amyloid patients. Now I see more wild type uh, amyloid patients than even AL amyloid patients. And again, these patients can have heart failure. They oftentimes have carpal tunnel syndrome. A couple other associated features to think about is biceps tendon rupture or spinal, tenos spinal stenosis. Um, common things we see in our elderly population. And oftentimes they come in, they've had atrial fibrillation uh, for several years. Uh, they've often been hospitalized with shortness of breath and positive troponins. Um, which uh, uh, leads them to catheterization. So, so we are seeing these people in our practice and oftentimes we're missing them, but ECHO really has some nice clues uh, that can help us diagnose these patients. And so we'll spend a little time talking about wild type amyloid uh, during this discussion. So when we talk about the two main types of amyloid, again, AL amyloid light chain, in this particular illness, the, the protein factory is from the plasma cells. Now these cells secrete a protein with both a heavy chain and a light chain, and it gets circulated in the system, blood system, and then they get deposited in the organs. And depending upon which organ it gets deposited in, the symptoms can be different. Hits the kidney, renal failure, heart, heart failure, nerves, neuropathy. Wild type amyloid, or A amyloid, TTR type, this is a transrethrin amyloid, and the liver is the protein factory. And this transthyrethin is actually a protein that's used to uh, a carrier protein by the body. And here, the liver makes this protein. It's a tetramer. And as it's broken down, uh, it can break down abnormally and form different uh, uh, forms of itself when it re recombines that are more unstable. And when these form, they form these fibrils that can be deposited in, in your heart, and thus they can look like and act like amyloid, and it is amyloid. Two types, again, ATTTRM mutation, or ATTRWT, wild type, 
which again was known as senile. So as a cardiologist, those, an echocardiographer, those are the three big types of amyloid that you really need to be aware of. So what happens to these patients? And so AL amyloid is the disease that you don't really want to get. It's the one we thought about in med school where it's the hematologic illness, that very, very poor prognosis. And you can see in those first three to four or three to six months, there is a huge drop in mortality, a big, big survival hit. And what Dr. Grogan, who's the head of our amyloid clinic, points out is that patients are dying while cardiologists are pondering the diagnosis. So that's why it's so important for us to be aware of this illness. And this delay in prognosis is a big component as to why the pro prognosis is so, is so poor and the, and the outcomes are worse. And there has been some improvement in the outcome, but you can see uh, prognosis is still relatively poor in this group where you're talking, you know, five years survival in the 40% range or 50% range perhaps. And uh, the ones that get chemotherapy are ones we typically identify a little bit earlier in their, in, later in their course. Whereas the patients that we've identified earlier, they are more likely to proceed to stem cell treatment because they don't have as much involvement with their other organs. They're otherwise, functional scores are doing better. And you can see these patients do much better. So that's why it's so important for us to identify these patients early on so they can get the optimal therapy before we have multi-organ involvement, which leads them to different types of chemotherapy. So what Dr. Grogan likes to point out that AL amyloid is a race against time, and it's really a medical urgency. And she would point out that once you think someone has amyloid, you should assume that it's AL until proven otherwise, because if you slowly, methodically go through the workup, the prognosis of your patients that have AL amyloid is much worse. That's why she would always argue you should say it's AL amyloid until you can prove it's TTR uh, amyloid. And then once, once the diagnosis is considered, you give a week to answer yes or answer no. And there's a few ways that we can, uh, we'll go through on how to test for this. The subtyping of individual amyloid, it will take weeks, but you can go amyloid yes or amyloid no, typically on your blood work, your testing, your fat aspirate, and usually most pa places should be able to get that answer within a week. And then she would argue, assume it's AL amyloid and work on the referral process, and then be pleasantly pleased if it's uh, one of the other subtypes of amyloid. So how do we screen for amyloid? One, ECG. That was one of the things that we were taught when I was in med school. Unfortunately, the absence of low voltage does not exclude amyloid. It's not as sensitive as we were hoped, hoping or specific. Echo and MRI both are very good at picking up amyloid. Um, echo with our strain imaging, MRI with late adenine enhancement. Unfortunately, although it can tell you you have amyloid, it cannot distinguish AL from TTR, from wild type, from, in, from mutated. When you're thinking about AL amyloid, it's important to check free, free light chains, fat aspirate, which we use a lot uh, on almost all our patients. About 80% of the people with AL amyloid will have a positive fat aspirate, and about 15% will of people with TTR amyloid will be positive. And you typically can do tissue typing to find out which subtype of tissue it is, a subtype of amyloid it is off these tissues. The PYP scan or the bone scintigraphy that was recently discovered, it's relatively sensitive and specific for TTR. We'll talk a little bit about the manuscripts that were out there and why it's probably not as sensitive and as specific as we thought it was in the past, mainly because their patient population of their papers was a very high, uh, high, high uh, patients had amyloid already. And if your, clinician, if your clinical suspicion remains, do a cardiac biopsy, you think it's cardiac amyloid. If it's renal, bi renal amyloid, you think a renal biopsy. So what's our diagnostic alg algorithm when we're looking for somebody with amyloid? And usually there should be a clinical suspicion or you see something on an MRI or an echocardiogram. We would argue we'd start with light chain analysis, looking for serum light changes with immunofixation, both urine and serum. And if a monoclonal protein is present, we proceed with a fat aspirate or a bone marrow biopsy. We would always start with a fat aspirate. Uh, 
And if amyloid is identified and you have your typical echo, your EM, echo or MRI findings, your cardiac amyloid is confirmed. And then the utilization of the tissue will be able to get the specific subtype of amyloid. If your MRI is negative and you have a monoclonal protein and you're still suspicious, this is a time when you would consider biopsy because the diagnosis is so important. What about if a monoclonal protein is not present? Then we typically go for, if you have the typical imaging on echo or MRI with a negative monoprotein present, we can do our nuclear study, a PYP uh, scan or DPD scan, and there's significant uptake, we then assume or are able to make the diagnosis of TTR amyloid. The PYP scan was accurate enough to be utilized in our uh, clinical trials to be able to make the diagnosis. We then do a blood test for TTR sequencing as that will allow us to then look for wild type versus an inherited form. Um, the wild type will not notice any mutations, and if the mutation is positive, then we have a hereditary type of amyloid, and there's you know, nearly 50 of them involved already identified at this point in time. So what about wild type trans-3-irethan trans amyloid? It, when I was a resident and fellow, we called this senile amyloid, and it was just seen in old people, and we didn't worry that much about it but we probably were underestimating the significance of this illness. Thus far, about 90% of the cases have been seen in men, and it's increasingly recognized. The clues we mentioned briefly earlier can include carpal tunnel syndrome, and that's usually five to 10 years prior to the diagnosis, biceps tendon rupture, spinal stenosis. You can have atrial dysrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, conduction disease, and heart failure. And oftentimes, you'll see people with normal ejection fraction, thick walls, and a low stroke volume index on the cardiac echocardiogram, and, and that can be a clue for you. We really don't know what the true prevalence of this illness is. Dr. Grogan likes to point out that many of these cases are hiding in our plain sight. When we look at autopsy series of people over 85 years old, up to 25% of them do have TTR amyloid in their heart. Now, whether or not that's clinically relevant, it's really hard to know, but certainly we know that as we age, the presence of TTR amyloid gets quite high. When we looked at patients in men over 50 years old and women over 60 years old that had a carpal tunnel release, when they looked at that tissue, 10% of them had amyloid in that tissue, consistent with TTR amyloid. Our heart failure patients with heart, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, if we looked at the subset over 60 years old with a thick septum and looked at them with a DPT scan, 30% were positive. So with that thicker septum, we need to be thinking about uh, PY, uh, P scans looking for amyloid. About 5% of the people with severe calcific aortic stenosis and up to 15% of the people who underwent TAVR had uh, uh, TTR amyloid. And this isn't surprising that the TAVR population would be higher than the AS population because those patients tend to be older and sicker. So always keep in mind when we're looking at these patients to, to think could amyloid be playing a role. So what do we see on the echocardiogram? Usually we'll see increased RV, free wall thickness, and LV wall thickness, and it tends to be concentric correlate with our ECG. If you have low voltage or normal voltage in very thick walls, be suspicious. Look for valve and atrial septal thickening. Look for diastolic filling patterns that are restrictive. One of the things I look at is reduced cardiac index in somebody with a normal ejection fraction. I think that's quite helpful. Look for atrial enlargement and dysfunction. And the presence of pericardial effusion, uh, I think I see it a little bit more often in AL rather than TTR but that too can be a clue for um, amyloid. And if you're in the stress echo world, when you have a false positive stress echo when somebody gets a hypotensive response in an older person, think of amyloid as a possible cause of this. And then the best thing and the most specific and the most sensitive and specific thing we have in the echo lab is this strain pattern. Uh, it's a bullseye pattern, which is apical sparing. It's very good, but I will tell you, it's not completely specific for amyloid. I have many patients that I see in the amyloid clinic that can have this pattern, 
but in the right clinical setting, in the right patient, it's a very good imaging test. The strain will be very helpful in picking up the amyloid patients. When we're thinking about ca cardiac amyloid, remember, it's not all about wall thickness. This particular patient had AL amyloid, had end-stage clinical heart failure, and actually ended up getting a heart transplant six months later. This patient, who has much more impressive echo findings, wild-type TTR, very thick walls, could walk three miles a day. So sometimes it's not just the wall thickness. We gotta look at everything else, that, much like all the things we have in echo. We look at stroke volume, cardiac index, all these things help us, BNPs, troponins, all these markers can help us risk stratify our patients. So what things can we look at when, when we're trying to make the diagnosis of amyloid? I think most of us would agree the classic case is pretty easy to diagnose, but the problem that we see, it's this infiltration of these light chains or in, in TTR amyloid, the uh, polymers into the, pro, into the muscle. That's why their BNP is abnormal and the troponins are abnormal because these, these light chains are toxic to the muscle and cause tissue damage. And this results in the cardiac dysfunction. So remember, it's a toxic infiltrative myocardial disease. And so you're gonna see some atypical presentations. It can be quite complex. So just a note to keep yourself open, to look for the variation in these amyloid patients will help you make the diagnosis earlier before they become end stage. I mentioned a couple times about looking at a stroke volume index uh, on patients with amyloid. And one of the ways we stage our amyloid patients is with troponins and BNPs and ejection fraction. But when we looked at stroke volume index, its performance was, was similar to strain in predicting survival in AL patients, independent of our biomarker strain sta staging. And so MCF is a ratio of uh, stroke volume to LV mass and a, and a constant. But a simpler thing is stroke volume index. A stroke volume index above and below 33 mLs per meter squared predicted outcomes in AL amyloid. Similarly, a cardiac index above and below 2.4 predicted outcomes in patients. And really, Doppler-derived variables like stroke volume really integrate a lot of things together, the systolic and diastolic function. So really, if you work as an echocardiographer, it's not surprising that these markers can be very powerful in predicting outcomes. So what are other ways to make this diagnosis? When we look at bone scintography, it's really, really, really some rebirth of some old data. This initial paper is very old from Dr. Gertz and Dr. Kyle from 1987. They, did, they know way back 30 years ago that they could identify uh, amyloid uptake in the heart with technetium-99 pyrophosphate. And what they look at is the heart uptake, and they look at, look at compared to the ipsilateral and contralateral lung, usually the contralateral lung. And different centers will use, use different ratios, 1.2, 1.4, 1.5. And depending upon the ratio you use, and then whether it's a spect or planar, you get different sensitivities and different specificities. So if you're doing the PYP scan, one important question would be, is, is your lab using a spect or is it doing a planar test? And what is their ratio that they use for their cutoff? So this seminal paper published uh, a few years ago looked at uh, non-biopsy diagnosis of TTR amyloid. And they had 1,217 patients, about 75% of them underwent DPD scan, about 200, 200 of them went on my PYP scan, and the rest had HMD P scans. And in this population who had been screened by echocardiography, MRI, and clinical screens, strains, this PYP scan has a 99% sensitivity and an 86% specificity for TTR amyloid. And most of their false positives were due to the patients that also had an underlying AL uptake. And their conclusion was in the absence of a monoclonal protein, the positive predictive value is very high and approaches 100%. But a couple caveats to this paper. Remember, these people that they were testing already had been screened for, t for amyloid by other testing, including echocardiography. So their sensitivity and specificity are likely gonna be falsely elevated. 
But it is reasonable to say that bone scintography, and what we use as a PYP scan, really enables a diagnosis of cardiac TTR amyloid reliably without the uh, need for biopsy, and that is in a patient that does not have a monoclonal gammopathy. And these are accurate enough that in several of our amyloid clinical trials, a positive PYP scan has been diagnostic enough, so we did not need tissue. So again, the limitations, I've mentioned it a couple times. Sometimes our patients also will have a monoclonal gammopathy. Anywhere, looking at the studies, from 10% up to 40% of the patients with uh, wild-type amyloid also have a mild monoclonal gammopathy. And in this case, you have to be very careful with the PYP scan. And much like a monoclonal gammopathy has an algorithm for MUGAs, for these people, we also the, the MUGAs should stand for must go under the skin. In other words, you need tissue to make the diagnosis. And Dr. Groen got this from Dan Judge, and I think that's an important thing. If you have a monoclonal gammopathy, and you have a positive PYP scan, we can't be certain that's not an AL amyloid. So, so be, be cautious with, with, with patients with monoclonal gammopathies. So as we mentioned, the initial studies were done on patients with a very high pretest probability, so that probably overestimates the sensitivity and specificity. And the guidelines do require typical echo and MRI features before we get the PYP scan to make the diagnosis. And we probably don't know the true sensitivity and specificity in general populations. We know it will be less. That's, that, that's not surprising. And we don't really need to panic about this, but we just have to be aware of the potential limitations and options that, that we have. So what is the role of image in cardiac amyloid? I think ECHO is probably has a real key, fat, key role in, it, in, in amyloid. It can give us the morphology of the LV and the RV. We look at systolic and diastolic function. We get atrial function, we can get strain, the bullseye pattern, we can see stroke volume, wall thickness, and so echocardiogram really plays a key role in diagnosing amyloid. I don't think any of these images can really, echo or CMR unfortunately cannot tell TTR from AL amyloid. If we think somebody has TTR amyloid and they do not have a monoclonal gammopathy, either DPD or PYP scan, we use PYP scan, is our next step to, to look for TTR amyloid. And we look at the ratio again to the heart, to the contralateral lung. And MRI is very good. And, and again, looking uh, for MRI, uh, looking for amyloid, it's, it's very accurate. They look for late gadolinium enhance, enhancement. And there are some other techniques that are ongoing and investigational. But given the ubiquitous nature of echocardiography, I think it still remains the most common and most important test we have for, echo, for identifying amyloid patients. When we're looking at responses to therapy, there's not any real single one measure that works perfectly. We want to integrate it to all our other tests. I mean, when I'm in the echo lab, I look at troponins and BNPs, ECGs, uh, using all our tests together and trying to find uh, what is our true diagnosis and response. I'm going to spend about five minutes to eight minutes on treatment of cardiac amyloidosis uh, before we conclude. I, I, AL amyloid is really a hematological illness. I tell my patients when I see them, if you have AL amyloid, your most important doctor is your hematologist. And, and these people, if they're found early on and don't have advanced disease in other organs, stem cells seems to be the way to go. The, their outcomes are very good or are much better. When we looked at the previous three-year survivals, we're in the 90% range compared to uh, other therapies. We do have chemotherapy-based therapies and monoclonal antibodies, and these are always expanding and changing uh, almost, it seems like, on a monthly basis. Wild-type amyloid is really what's responsible for a lot of the explosion of the literature. There's medication trials to stabilize the TTR or even um, some mRNA inhibitors to inhibit uh, the formation of the TTR. Traditionally, the liver transplant was done for TTR amyloid and their five-year five survival is in that 70% range. But some of our medications here to prevent the formation of these tetramers is getting so good that this may soon be obsolete and may end up using medical therapy rather than liver uh, transplant for the TTR amyloid. So that will be, could potentially be a change for us in the future. And in isolated cases, 
We could think about cardiac transplantation, support devices. And by the time you get this far down the road, you probably would be at a major center that deals with amyloid on a daily basis because these would only be uh, completed in, in select patients. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about AL amyloid because that really is in the realm of the hematologist. But the TTR amyloid treatment here is really done by uh, cardiology. And one of the goals, you, you know, either three ways, you stop production in the liver, you stabilize that protein, or you disrupt the fibrils. And that's the three ways to try to prevent progression of amyloid. The liver production stopped is really with TTR silencers. Um, uh, Patisseron is one of them that we've utilized and has been published data on, and this has been proven to be beneficial in the people with uh, the neuropathy associated with amyloid. The one that we have used the most in cardiology are TTR stab stabilizers, and uh, the drug that you probably have heard about recently is called Tefamidus or Vindaquil is the brand name, and that medication will kind of go over some of the recent uh, trials. There's also the old-fashioned dolobit or difluinazole in lab tests anyway, in, 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 in the test tube, um, and looking at some biomarkers, difluinazole seemed to have reasonable efficacy in stabilizing the protein. With tefamidus, we have clinical data, hospitalization, and mortality. With difluinazole, we have BNP uh, and strain data. And then a new investigational drug that's currently being investigated to stabilize protein uh, is being randomized and certainly likely will be completed in the next year or two, looking uh, at an additional stabilizer to stabilize these proteins. We, pre previous to the publication of Defamidus, we were doing more of these, doxycycline and Tudka, to do fibril disruptors, but we haven't been utilizing these quite as much. But it's just important to remember, we can attack these at all three sites, you know, disrupt production, stabilize the protein, uh, and, and uh, the, the, the fibers at the end. So I mentioned the tefamidus therapy, and this was what was a huge breakthrough in the TTR amyloid world. If you were going to design a drug, you'd want it to A, to improve survival and reduce hospitalization. I think B, I'd want it to improve exercise tolerance, and C, I'd want it to improve quality of life. And fortunately for these people, um, they kind of hit a home run. There was reductions in all-cause mortality and cardiac-related hospitalizations and reduced decline in functional status and improved quality of life. A couple things I will tell my patients when you looked at, at the defamidus therapy, it takes about 18 months before I see any real mortality benefit. So probably the benefit I'm going to see is going to be in the younger, healthier patients. Class 4 patients might not get as much benefit. If their one-year survival is very poor, it's hard to tell them that they're going to get any big benefit. When they look at change in six-minute walk, similarly, you can see that, unfortunately, all of us get older and go downhill. But as compared to placebo therapy, at about six months' time, I could already see improvement in six-minute walk as compared to placebo uh, patients. When we look at quality of life scores, again, at about six months time, I can start to see improved quality of life scores. And this did, did continue through the 30 months of the trial. So how I look at this data, when I talk to the patient, I tell them it takes about 18 months to see any survival benefit. If you're really early on, it's hard to know what to do sometimes because a lot of these patients are doing pretty well. And if they have other comorbidities, that may be the key thing that they end up having symptoms from. But for patients with moderate, mild or moderate symptoms, I'm certainly tefamidus is a reasonable, reasonable treatment. And if you look at their data, there, there was a 30% reduction of all-cause mortality compared to placebo. So it's a big difference. We don't see that much reduction in lots of our therapies. And the number needed to treat was only 7.5 or 8. Well, what's the problem? You know, you know it's improved survival, improved six-minute walk, quality of life scores. But this is very expensive, right around two hundred dollars to $240,000 a year. So if you're a very elderly and very, very frail, it becomes an ethical discussion as much as a medical discussion. So it, it is an expensive therapy, and it's not like pre uh, prescribing beta blockers. We need to think a little bit and work with our patients and have a discussion with them. 
Insurances, coverage is variable. I have people that spend as little as $5 per pill to as much as spend, or $5 a month to as much, to some as spend as $10,000 a month. And so um, insurance coverage is critical. Typically, because of the cost of this therapy, it's only handed out in specialty pharmacies. We don't have uh, prescriptions to our local pharmacy going out very often because it's very expensive. And it's typically delivered monthly to the patient by FedEx insured, so they don't get like six months worth of drug delivered to them. Uh, Patisseron is one of the other ones that uh, ha has been utilized, and this is uh, a silencer. And this really has been utilized in the neurology world. And, and the amyloid neuropathy that I've seen, I'm, I don't see a ton of them, but it's not like the neuropathy that you and I think of with diabetes. The ones that I've seen, they'll say six months ago or a year ago, I ran a 10K and now I'm in a walker. They, it's a very profound neuropathy. And these patients have had a huge response to the patisseron therapy uh, compared to placebo. This again is also very expensive. It's actually more expensive than tefamidus, but, and it's given intravenously, but it's very, very promising for management of these patients. So both, both of the, the patisseron and the nostron are, are RNA interfering therapy. Uh, there, this has been published. This is phase three trials. Uh, very sick patients have been excluded. Hasn't been looked at a lot in heart failure, and there's noise in their literature. Sometimes it says it makes heart failure worse. Sometimes it had no effect. Sometimes said it was better. So I do not have a good data yet on what, what these drugs potentially could do for, for heart failure. And they weren't designed to assess mortality of cardiology endpoints. That's probably why we don't have good data. So where are we in summary? When someone, when you suspect cardiac amyloid, Dr. Grogan, who's the head of our, 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 our clinic, would say it's a medical urgency, and I think that's a reasonable way to look at it. You should try to make that diagnosis within a few weeks if you can. And, and, and you don't have to subtype, but you should say yes or no, this patient has amyloid. And if they do have amyloid, they should be referred to a, med to a big center that works with amyloid. AL amyloid typically is a plasma cell disorder. It needs chemotherapy and delay in the diagnosis is, is associated with excess mortality. So we need to be good about making this diagnosis. TTR amyloid, I see a lot more of this than I used to. Oftentimes it's unexplained heart failure in a person with normal ejection fraction. Increased wall thickness in the absence of hypertension. Unexplained dyspnea. Two big types, hereditary, and then the most common type that you and I will see is the ATTR wild type, again male, biceps tendon rupture, carpal tunnel, atrial fibrillation, the things that we all have seen again and again. Treatment options for the TTR amyloid in summary, it's expensive, but they improve survival, quality of life, six minute walk, and patisseron for neurology, it was a significant improvement in their functional scores. With that, I will conclude uh, by saying it's probably really not rare, we see it every day, Echocardiography is a key to making the diagnosis and helping us with manage these patients. Strain imaging should be used to make the diagnosis. I think Doppler, including stroke volume index and cardiac index, is very good for prognosis. The screening tests critical to identify the AL patients include light chain, serum and urine immunofixation, and a fat aspirate. In the PYP scan for TTR, but we need to remember we can't use this if they have a monoclonal protein. And it's just like Dr. Grogan says, it's, this is not, it's the beginning of the story, not the end. With that, uh, I'll conclude.